in the television committee and, and found it really um, empowering actually and I would ad advise anybody who's interested in getting involved in the guild start with the committees um, because you see how things are getting done you get to hear that you're not on your own so that was great it was a really good committee at the time then I got co-opted onto a couple of negotiating teams so I'm on the ITV negotiating team and the PACT one which is for independent production companies and that was a heck of a learning curve so I went from barely reading through my own contract because my agent does it to, to actually have not a bad grasp of contract law now i'm not i'm not quite to lawyer stage but i'm not bad at it and understanding you know how to push for things how to negotiate i've had great training in that and i think that's helped me in in everyday life as well uh, standing up for yourself so that's been great and then uh, Gail asked me to be a deputy and then Gail asked me to replace her so um, I, I've sort of worked my way up as it so it's, it's been about seven years I've been involved with the guild now. Well, and how about yourself? Been, uh, well uh, so I've been a guild member for a very long time um, but my sister who is uh, hanging about my garden actually um, is um, uh, a wonderful writer and um, one day she phoned me up and she had a problem with the contract and I said well, why are you ringing me why are you not bringing your union? And I said, she said, what are you talking about? I said, the writer's guild, why are you not ringing the writer's guild? You're a writer, you should belong to the writer's guild. And uh, indeed she phoned the writer's guild and, uh, and said what the problem was and uh, they brilliantly sorted it out for her. Um, and she became a passionate member of the writer's guild. And then it's her fault because she said, the writer's guild is going to need a new president. Do you think you would be interested <laughs> in, uh, in seeing if that was a possibility? Uh, so uh, me having sent her to the Guild in the first place, she is the reason um, it turned around is the reason why I'm the president. But uh, I'm a, a passionate activist and I'm a passionate uh, unionist and I, and I genuinely believe that we are all better if we work together. Um, mm. Plus, what a nice bunch of people. Yes. I mean... That's the other thing. It's just yeah. a lovely group, isn't it? So it is. I, I do enjoy the meetings. I'm missing the first face, although whether we'll ever go back to non-Zoom meetings, because obviously it is much more convenient for people with deadlines, with kids, with sure. disabilities. So it's been an interesting learning curve. But you can't few... have a pint in the NUJ bar afterwards, which is... It is and it's a very fine bar as well. It's a very fine bar. So tell me, Lisa, what do you think it would look like for a writer in the UK if we didn't have the Writers Guild? It would be, it's already isolating being a writer. We, we spend a lot of time in rooms such as this. That's not the real Iron Man behind me. That is a cardboard cart. That's the company I have day to day. Uh, Thor is in the kitchen. Um, it, it would be so isolating. It would be so easy for us to be bulldozed and exploited and bullied because it is an industry where lots of people want to get into writing and um, are willing to make compromises and sacrifices in order to do that and some of them are, are per the time you spend building your portfolio getting your career going is enough of a sacrifice without you sacrificing um, stability employment protections um, and a decent rate of pay and that's the bottom line for the guild is making sure that as professionals you get paid a fair rate for the work you do and it's not much to ask but I think that will be in danger without the union. I also think I think um, it's a sort of a common factor amongst writers no matter how brilliant they are that sometimes they lack confidence yeah and so if somebody says well I'm going to make your play or I'm going to produce your book or whatever you're just so delighted that somebody thinks you can write that that maybe you undercut yourself do you think that's true if, oh. if we don't have a union looking or a guild looking after you? Absolutely. One of, the, one of the best campaigns we ever did and the resources for it are still on our website was the free is not an option campaign that was started by Bill Armstrong. He was chair of the, the TV committee at the time. He's now chair of the Scotland committee. Um, and he set out guidelines for how much work you should do for free because it can go on ad infinitum. Can you just write another draft of this? Can you just do a few tweaks? We're putting it in front of the broadcaster. We're putting it in front of the theatres. Next time, we'll find some money for you. And so that, that campaign really crystallised what was a, a significant problem for a lot of writers, not knowing when to say, um, you won't get another word out of me until someone's hand goes in their pocket. Because the worry um, is that that person's not going to come back to you, that that producer will think, well, I will find somebody who'll do it uh, for free. Um, and do you think there's a concern now since the lockdown that people be so desperate to open theatre for example 
that um, theatres will say, well, we've got no money to pay you, but we do need your product. I, I'm really concerned about that. I, I worry that in a time of, of real strict and, and short money, um, people get very conservative in their choices. I think we'll see a lot of productions by uh, dead white men um, because they're free. Um, I worry that new writing is going to take a hit. That's another reason why we're here, to hold people's feet to the fire and say, if you don't develop new writing, if you don't find the new talent, then we're going to end up with the same stuff over and over again. I, our creative industries are such an important part of our economy. If we don't keep things moving and finding new talent, finding new voices, it will wither and die on the, on the vine. We're already in danger. Let's not endanger it further by making very poor and but safe choices. And so if somebody's being asked to work for free, um, what is the best response? I mean, I would imagine it's to say, I'm going to have to speak to the Guild or the Guild has very strict rules about this. I'm sure you wouldn't want to go against the Writers Guild. Is that the sort of thing? Absolutely. I, I would say take a look at the free is not an option guidelines. Uh, we allow for a certain amount of free writing to be done, you know, when you're pitching the idea. No one expects, you know, you don't go in with a piece of paper, empty chest and go, right, give us a fiver or you can't see it. Um, it's a good tactic, though. It, it might work, you never know. Um, <laughs> but the, there is a point where they go, if you are genuinely interested in this idea and everybody else in the room is getting paid, the development executives, the artistic directors, whoever is asking you to do this work, then there's a point at which you should get paid. So we ask our members to chain up on your rights. It's the best day's work you will do for yourself. Know what the minimums are, know what your rights are. We've, we've got so many resources on the website outlining those in easy, very digestible forms as well. So yeah, know, know your cutoff point and you'll be surprised. And, and we've had anecdotal evidence back from writers the point in which you go i really i'm really glad you like this idea but i will not be doing any more work on this until we can talk about money it's the first time you do it it's a real heart in the mouth moment it's like, oh, yeah. this, this could go either way it actually usually only goes one way which is um they've been waiting for you to ask for money they, they may even have a little pot of money put to one side, but they're not going to bring it out until you actually ask for it. So I've, I've also found it's very useful when you've been batting something backwards and forwards with a producer to finally write an email going, here with my final draft. Yes, that's, absolutely. That's, that's a very clear thing. Um, <laughs> and, and I think if you don't uh, feel that you have the courage uh, to do that, know that we're on your side. I think yes. that's, the, that's the other thing, there's a whole bunch of us. Now, one of the things, you know, the world is changing, uh, good heavens, I mean, look at us now, zooming in each other's houses. Um, uh, there is a worry, I think, about online content as well, because I think there has become a strange uh, public perception that everything online is free, that you mm. shouldn't have to pay. You shouldn't have to pay for journalism, you shouldn't have to pay for all, all manner of content. And I, I want to know how, for, let's look at television, for example, which is your area of expertise. How is the Guild working to make sure that television writers get paid properly if their work is shown online? One of our, our big victories was the setting up of the writer's digital payment um, scheme. So if you have written a piece of television, whether it's a uh, children's show, an uh, uh, episode of Doctors, whatever, um, you will get some money for the number of clicks on the iPlayer, on the ITV player, on all four. Um, it goes into a big pot. We set up the, the firm that looks after it uh, and we do regular um, payouts from that. It was, I, I was around at the time um, our previous general secretary was trying to organise that. That was not a straightforward thing. Getting the data of how many clicks um, your shows had on the iPlayer those kind of things was there was a lot of oh well, well so we just oh, we don't know how to to do that and um, it's a lot of hard negotiating to say we don't believe that you don't have the figures for that please can we have them um, well, Netflix rather famously won't tell you how many members they have and how much uh, subscription that kind of thing this is true although Netflix I think are loosening up a little bit now because it it does them good to say we've got a hit show if, if everybody's um, not aware, so something like Shit's Creek, for example, that's been a massive hit on Netflix. So they'll crow about the successes. I think the, the things that aren't successful will disappear off the end of the algorithm. Um, but also there's been, in lockdown, some real surprise hits 
on the iPlayer, which will now get paid out. So uh, I wrote several episodes of Waterloo Road and, and suddenly I'm getting emails about Waterloo Road again because a whole new generation of kids are watching it. It's, I mean, it's a crazy show, ludicrous. Do enjoy it if, if you like it. But it's one of those shows that a new audience will come to generation after generation. But and that's the fact not a that, gift then. That's not a gift then from the writer. Absolutely. So knowing that, you know, that 14 year old who wants to find out what happened to Dante is clicking on, on the iPlayer and that means eventually a little bit of money will come to me is really great. And it's writers make a lot of money from residuals and um, repeat fees and that kind of thing. It's, it's what makes our industry sustainable. If we all signed off just one in perpetuity, uh, fee. I don't think a lot of people's careers would be safe because because of those ups and downs. So, well, let's talk about. Um, I mean, an area of writing which, about which I know nothing, but I've learned so much by sitting in the uh, the, the committee meetings. Um, uh, I expect that a lot of people don't even consider, for example, that there's a writer involved uh, in video games. Mm -hmm. I suspect people don't even think about it that there would yeah. be a writer who comes up with the I don't know the format for an adventure or the story for an adventure. But so uh, so talk to me about those in the industry who write video games. They were very, and actually this week it's very topical. There's a, there's a couple of scandals breaking within that world of, of women who've been exploited within the video games world and, and we would say to anybody please come to us we have a fantastic chair of video games Andy uh, who has worked on all sorts of um, really big games and, and he's passionate about his section of the industry um, but yeah it, it was something to be honest with you I haven't considered but it's a large a growing constituency um, within our union of people who write the dialogue for the the very elaborate scenes if you haven't been a games player for a while and I'm, I, I, Pac-Man I think was the last thing I played uh, <laughs> they can be crush um, but now if you see that game in the the elaborate worlds the the world building the design but the dialogue and the character work that goes into them of course there are writers involved these suddenly you go oh yeah absolutely oh, only writers even writers go oh yeah and that's really good. oh yeah um, you well, mentioned uh, women in the in the video games industry. Uh, so it's an interesting thing uh, in terms of women in union membership. Uh, in the past year, union membership amongst people who identify as female, it's increased by 170,000. Uh, I just wonder why it seems to be extremely important for women to be members of, of, of unions and indeed of the Guild. It's We've had a lot of success um, looking after our female members over the last few years after the Equality Rights Report. I think there's an understanding that there is more strength in numbers um, now amongst women. I think it certainly is off the back of the massive news stories around Me Too and Weinstein. That understanding that the strength of women when they come together, and we see it in our office, we've got an almost all-female team in the Writers Guild office, apart from Paul John, who's lovely. Um, but that, that strength that women have and that desire to look after each other and make sure that people are elevated, um, I think it's been an enormous positive thing that's happened over the last few years out of something truly horrendous. Um, and I think that's been reflected in union membership. Collectivism um, is definitely the way forward. And I think we're seeing that. And I think women are certainly seeing that. I mean, uh, you know, you say something horrendous. Let's talk about COVID-19. Um, I think a lot of pressure for writers to say, oh, you're at home. Great. Three months. Write a book. And uh, there's nothing worse, I think, in terms of being able to concentrate than everybody going, oh, it'll be perfect for you. Um, t talk to me about the impact on, on writers on the industry and why the Guild has been so important. Um, it, it felt like grief the first couple of weeks I, I, I wrote about this in, in a blog, that I, I was very fortunate. My job kept going, but to hear people who, who even in our industry, were relatively safe in their jobs, their work disappearing. I mean, we all experience it, the clicking on the uh, diary, delete that, delete, that's not going to happen. I've got tickets on my notice board just here that, yeah, I should have been in the theatre yesterday, that's not going to be obviously happening. Um, I, I had a couple of talk, uh, plays that were going on, so those were cancelled. That, that first three weeks was so utterly devastating and so unclear as to when, and it still is, when we will get back to any form of normality. I think what I would say to, to writers is there are lots of discussions about how we do that um, and that happened almost immediately. That I'm, I'm so proud of the Writers Guild. Uh, Ellie, our, our, assist, our, our General Secretary, and Leslie, our Assistant General Secretary, have been flat out 
first of all, making sure that freelancers were recognised. We've written to Parliament over and over again, provided evidence for parliamentary select committees, that kind of thing, about the effect of COVID on freelance workers. I think the government thought it was very straightforward. They didn't realise how many people would fall through the crack cracks of their system um, and luckily the unions were there to say hey this is not working. Um, I think our next push is to make sure there is some sort of rescue package for the arts and that's not because our arts are lovely and, and I love the theatre, it's because we make such a massive contribution to the yeah. British economy. Millions. Just absolutely millions and jobs that are adjacent to that, the, the, the taxi drivers, the um, cafes, the restaurants that, that rely on people going into town to see a show, tourism in London um, and that's that's not to be reductive about, we have also enormous creativity in, in our industry, I'm very proud of our theatre industry but without some sort of rescue and Germany have announced another billion euros for their industry, we will be behind everybody else, we won't be competitive, we won't be the world beating, to use that awful phrase, um, creative industry that we have been, it will, as I say, wither and die on the vine. So that's our next push. Yeah, I um, mean, you know, when you hear that the theatres can open, but they can't do live performances, you think, does anybody have a plan? Does anybody yeah. have any kind of a plan as to what's going on? Um, what about mental health uh, support? Because I want to make sure that um, that people are getting the kind of assistance that they need. Absolutely. So there, there's some, we have, have uh, a brilliant COVID-19 page on the website. There's some uh, helplines for anybody who's feeling um, desperate or feeling um, under pressure. Please do get in touch with them or, or do give us a call. I mean, my DMs are open on Twitter. I shouldn't really say that in a public forum, but do get in touch. And some writers have got in touch with me. It could just be that you need a chat on the phone or it could be that we can point you in the direction of some, of some much more uh, serious serious help. Um, I, I'm, I'm really worried about our um, uh, about our, the mental health of everybody working in the industry. This everything being up in the air, unclear how things are going to shake down and get back to normal. And this sense of we're pushing to get back to normal but it doesn't feel like it at the moment is enormous detrimental. I would, I, and I would very seriously ask our members and anybody on this call, if you are suffering, if you are struggling, please reach out to us and we'll, we will help. And also, if you do know another writer, can I recommend buddying up with a writer? Um, so at the beginning, I found it almost impossible to sit at my desk and write. I was feeling so anxious. I buddied up with another writer who was feeling the same, and we wrote a paragraph of a short story each and passed it backwards and forwards yeah. um, and wrote the weirdest dystopian uh, short story. Um, but, but it got both of us back to our desks and got both of us writing. So do reach out to uh, other people in the industry who who will be feeling the same and, and if you're on your own i would say you know in terms of practicality there was that quote that went very viral on social media about oh during the plague shakespeare wrote leah not even sure that's true um nobody's going to be writing leah i, I no. would say admit that your work rate is going to be slower set achievable targets during the day for yourself if you are in a professional contract and i've done this speak to the people you are working with and say i have childcare. i have responsibilities for my parents it's taking four hours to do the shopping because of the one-way system in morrison's whatever it is that is limiting your writing don't feel like you're making excuses for it speak to people people will be quite understanding at the moment can i just show you this book i found on my shelf which i'd forgotten i had uh, it's called inquire within upon everything it was written in 1890 and just know that there is one book that's got absolutely everything in it if you if you feel you can't write, it was possible to write. Quite a slim book, I think. It's got literally <laughs> everything in it. Yeah. Uh, I now know how to get ink stains out of steel. Uh, right, let's go to some questions. Who is in charge of the questions? I think it's Nadine. Yeah, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. So we've had a couple of questions submitted previously on our Eventbrite. So let me go through some of those first. Um, okay, so Maya said, what is the Guild doing to empower a more diverse set of voices, especially for writers trying to break into the industry? So um, last year, over the last two years, uh, we've been setting up our Equalities and Diversity Committee. Um, they were at the last AGM, which I think was this week. I think it is a year since I, 
I became chair and Sandy became president this week, um, we officially recognised that committee. What I'd say to anyone is that work is always painfully slow. I'd love to be able to say that we're, as of next week, uh, our industry will become massively diverse and all women will get a fair crack of the whip and it'll all be fine. Uh, it, it takes a lot longer than that. Um, the work we did on the equality rights um, report for uh, women, we're extending to our black, Asian and, and minority eth ethnicity um, members uh, very soon. Um, we have work to do. I think that's, if the last few weeks have taught us anything, maybe everybody's rested on their laurels a little bit, but it is, that work is being undertaken. We'd like to hear from our, um, our members who uh, feel particularly affected by racism or a lack of diversity in the industry. There's a lot of work doing. The other thing that we also do, and it's very important for a union to do, is hold um, other people accountable. So we will do work on equality monitoring. We'll keep an eye on the BBC and ITV. We have a forum where we can bring up those issues. It, it usually causes a bit of awkward uh, shuffling in seats when we do bring it up, but that's a good reason to bring it up. Um, but we will keep going. But we also want to hear from our members. About it's really important, I think, that uh, that if there's any situation which somebody's uncomfortable with or they feel is not uh, fair or, or just in any way, that the union needs to know, or the guild yeah. needs to know about it because there's nothing that can be done uh, unless it's brought to the attention. Uh, and uh, I know everybody in the office is always delighted to take such a call and to see what they can do to help. So um, I'm hoping that we've reached a, a, a point of no return where change is inevitable. Um, yeah. But you know, uh, the world moves slowly. Uh, so as anybody who is waiting for equal pay for women uh, will attest to you, I think. Absolutely. Uh, Nadine. Okay. Um, Eleanor says, what changes have you made during your lockdown experience, which you hope to take forward post lockdown? Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Well, I have Good and bad. been completely honest. I have thoroughly enjoyed not having to go and hold a hundred charity auctions. Um, <laughs> I, it's a terrible thing. Uh, I would, um, I'm all in favour of doing charity, but I realise I was out most nights trying to raise money for one thing or another. Um, <laughs> so I'm afraid I have thoroughly enjoyed um, being allowed to stay at home. Um, that's probably not a very good thing for a person in the public eye. But um, whether I can maintain that or not, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I don't know if anybody else feels like this. I think I'm in danger of becoming slightly agoraphobic. Um, I'm not sure I really want to go out anymore. I, uh, so that's a, that's a, I don't know if I'm the only one who feels like that. But um, uh, certainly I think a work-life balance uh, I know lots of uh, people that I've spoken to, men and women, uh, feel that maybe that there's a there's no need to go back to the to the schedule that we all were working at before, and that we should have a look and see if we can't do something a little bit more balanced. I have, and my wife and I've been married a very very long time. Uh, for the very first time, been taking weekends off, and she hasn't known that in 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 decades um, and I might try and keep that up because it's rather jolly because the trouble with being a writer is you can just think oh, I'll just fiddle with that and I'll just and every day you can do a little bit of something and I've realized that taking time off is as valuable as sitting at my desk. I, I would endorse that I've I've been quite strict about weekends because I'm you know I'm isolating alone because I'm not in a relationship so um, finding things to do away from my screen on a weekend has been important but one of the big changes that I think has come about is this is Zoom meetings um, and it's it's been like a light switching on I think particularly for us at the Guild realising um, that actually we can um, engage with our members in this in what is not a perfect way but a great way our committees don't necessarily have to all meet in London every single time we've we've done our EC meetings like this and that means, for example, if we have members who have financial barriers, who have childcare responsibilities or have a disability, who would like to get involved in our committees, and we would have uh, certainly um, brought you in anyway, I think we're better equipped for it now. And I think um, we need to extend that to our industry. So uh, an end to, would you like to come down for a chat? Um, when it's 200 pound a pop on the train to do it, maybe some of the big companies and it's certainly something we can push for we can say would you consider using more virtual means to meet with writers for those little chats because yeah, if we can make it less london-centric 
If it yeah. can be less London centric, that would be a fine thing, particularly in terms of diversity. Then we really are reaching out as Absolutely. far as I'd, And during this time, I've been lucky. I've been able to drop in on uh, the comedy committee uh, meeting. I've been to the Scottish committee meeting and I was invited to the Welsh committee meeting. Now, doing that in a week would have involved a lot of time on uh, the on the trains backwards and forwards. But being able to do it from the comfort of my room with Iron Man watching me has been brilliant. <laughs> Great. Okay. Joseph says, as somebody just starting out in their writing career with a small amount of work under their belt, what advice can you give to form relationships with agencies, publishers, producers, or talent pools? And I think that covers a couple of questions that people have asked. That's great. It is incredibly difficult, and I think it has got more difficult because it is, uh, I mean, when I, that's how old I am, uh, there were no university courses teaching you how to write or how to, uh, how to get into media or, uh, it just didn't exist. Uh, you know, mostly people read, I don't know, English or history or something and then hoped for the best. So I think it has got much more difficult because it is much more competitive. Um, what I think is, d don't say no to opportunities is my thing. It's, it's really about uh, who you meet. Uh, you're going to do much better with an agent if you have already uh, been recommended to them by a, a writer who they represent. So if you know that writer, that's very helpful. I guess that is difficult if you don't already know somebody, but, f but find the opportunities. And sometimes the opportunities lie um, in, in your local area. They lie with the local radio station. They lie with the local newspaper. Um, let's not forget there's, some still, there's still some wonderful stuff that's happening very locally that probably doesn't isn't sung about as much as it should and and don't give up but this is a this is a business of of, of passion um when my son decided that he wanted to be uh, a playwright i said to him please don't do that darling please go and become a plumber or a carpenter or something and he said to me mom do not come between me and my passion and i thought oh you're going to make it because, because that's what it takes i'm afraid there's a lot of hard knocks ahead um but meet people at the guild join in the activities that you are able to join in with um it's a lot of it is who you know do you agree lisa i completely agree I, I would say um it's not a straight line um become resilient um and fatalistic so if, if you you know think you've made a great contact and then uh they disappear off the face of the planet and never answer your email again it's it's just not meant to be move on, keep forward motion um, going. Regional's very good, so um, look at the Royal Television Society. When things are back up and running, they run lots of events where you get to meet the people who are making television in your area and film in your area. Uh, look at the BFI. Um, look at us. Obviously, once we get up and running, there's a vet. just by being in this virtual event, you are already making a step forward in, in your career. Look for your local writing groups. Where we're lucky in uh, Yorkshire, we've got Script Yorkshire, but look at your local theatres when they open up again, if they've got writing groups. It's all, it's good for the soul. It's good to, to hang out with other writers. It's one of, one of the reasons I joined the Guild is I love hanging out with writers. Um, and it's it's good to start swapping information um, about things. Look at the BBC Writers Room website as well. Um, there are often opportunities. And if you're a Guild member, you're getting our weekly emails. So there's opportunities to go to training events and for competitions and, and um, uh, submissions on there as well. So uh, like I said, just being in this meeting, you're already doing good work, but keep it up. And it's, and it's tough. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. I don't recommend it, really. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, keep putting your uh, questions in the chat. I think we have time for maybe a couple more. So, um, and hopefully Amy is here because I think we have hopefully answered her question already, but how can writers create community in the current climate? And I think in general, how can writers come together when um, writing can often be so isolating? So one of the things I... Uh, Half of writing is procrastination. This is elaborate procrastination that I'm doing right now. But the other way I do it is on social media. Now, don't get me wrong, social media comes with its pitfalls and can be an absolute bear pit. But what I have found is, uh, I've been on Twitter for 10 years, is an enormous community of writers, very welcoming, very generous, 
um, the sharing of information that goes on on uh, social media. So that could be your local Facebook group and all of that kind of thing that people are very generous in saying, have you seen this? For example, Hope Mills in Manchester have put out a fantastic uh, competition today. You win £5,000 for a full length player and they produce the player uh, and you keep the rights. I know because I checked that. Um, we always check competitions, but that, you know, get yourself out there. Social media is a really good way of doing it. Um, there's, there's an essential rule of this industry that I would impart with you, and pardon my language, it's don't be a dick. So don't be the person who's kicking off every five minutes, or don't be so pushy that everybody goes, oh, God, here comes that person again. Be aware, have a little bit of self-awareness uh, and conduct yourself professionally to a certain extent uh, on social media, but that is a good way of, of making those contacts. And as you say, build, building community is a brilliant phrase, and I think that's a good way of doing it. And also there are enormous opportunities now to, to begin to create your own work, um, which although the industry has become much more competitive, there are aspects of it that didn't exist when I started. Um, so it is possible to make your own work and to get it in front of an audience via YouTube or any of those other uh, platforms. I had always wanted to do talks about women's history. Nobody else wanted to make it in telly. I've spent the last three months doing more than 50 talks on YouTube of the thing I wanted to say. Yeah. Uh, and now it has a following and then it makes money. As it happens, I'm giving the money away to a food bank. But, um, but, but it is possible to find avenues if you are determined to create your own work. Mm -hmm. And with an iPhone today, people can shoot astonishing and extraordinary things. So, so if people keep saying no, just say, well, so did I do it myself. Great. I think that's about it for questions. Um, uh, can I just jump in? I think I saw Jason asking how uh, Black and Asian members can approach the Guild. Um, if you go on our website, there's the emails for all the craft chairs. You can come to me uh, on there as well. My email's on there. You can ring the office. Uh, if you want to remain anonymous, if you search for report it on the website and you want to report some bad behaviour, there is an open survey there that looks at bullying and harassment and any kind of discrimination. So to answer that question, just get in touch. And if we're not the person to deal with it, we'll put you in touch with the right person to deal with whatever you want to talk to us about. Please know there are no glib answers to anything. No, it is hard. It is yeah. really hard. And it has been particularly hard during this time. And I am fully aware of it. It's been hard even for the most successful writers have felt as if they ought to be writing Lear or they ought to be, I don't know, improving their skill set in some way. If you haven't written anything and you're finding it very difficult, that's okay too. Um, and, and, and we are really here to support in any way that, that we can. And maybe we haven't thought of the way that we need to support, in which case uh, it's also possible to make suggestions um, and say, have you thought of doing this in this particular manner? Um, because it's a, it's a democratic process where, you know, the Guild is, is all of the members. It's not, uh, it's not the, it's certainly not me and Lisa at all, and it's certainly not the committee, <laughs> everybody together. Um, and you will find a, a welcome uh, place and a, and, a, and, a, and a smile from everybody who, you know, if you've got an idea of how things could be improved. We always want to hear you. Okay, we've got a couple more come through and, and just to let you know, we had a lot submitted. So um, if we don't get back to you um, or, or ask your question today, we're going to um, open up our emails and I'll speak about that so that we can have conversations later on. So is the Writers Guild able to collaborate in order to address all white writers rooms and encourage and achieve greater diversity across race, class, gender and disability in these spaces? So it's work we're already doing. So over the last uh, year or so, we've uh, been speaking to an all parliamentary group um, about working class access to the arts. Uh, we did that in collaboration with Equity and the Musicians Union and provided evidence um, to, it was a committee headed up by Tracy Brabin from Labour, but there were also, it was a cross party organisation. The report from that is out. It's, uh, it's not a quick fix, it's a problem with what we call the leaky pipeline that money and resources mean you can go further along in the journey um, to be a writer, to be an artist, to be a musician and you may also have had limited opportunities at educational level so we're talking to the government um, about that. In terms of all white writers rooms, yes certainly that is something that we um, are looking at and discussing. Um, I think hopefully 
um, it is becoming so socially acceptable and it shouldn't have had to get to this stage that I'm hoping we're seeing an end to them. I'm very happy to say that the writer's room I'm working in at the moment is in by no means a whitewash um, and that's as it should be but also I think it is beholden on writers with a, a certain amount of clout to speak up if they walk into a room and see nothing but white faces in front of them or nothing but male faces in front of them just the faces nothing else um, it, it is important for us to speak up and it's getting easier to speak up but that's what we're here for. We will continue to speak on this. We will continue to raise it. And we do. We have regular meetings with the BBC, with ITV, with all the theatre organisations. And it is on our agenda when we go into those meetings. And I, the conversations that I've been having with various uh, production companies, I, I don't think there's one now that would dare. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think so. I think the change is unstoppable and, uh, and uh, about bloody time. I think uh, one of the things that we learned from the women's report, and it was a bit of a shock because the, the figures in the women's report were so <laughs> incontrovertible, they were shocking. We knew they were going to be bad, we didn't think they were going to be that bad. And we were warned by the, the people doing the report, look, you might think you'll walk in and go, we've got the receipts, sort it out, and everybody in television will go, oh, oh no, oh no, we've been terrible people. The first reaction is unfortunately often anger and denial and that's where we come in we push past this so where it's like they're like two-year-olds having a tantrum we stand there we wait until they calm down and then we have a discussion about how can we solve this i think there may be a reaction to um black lives matter etc that is similar to that and i think that's really unfortunate i think you see it on social media from ordinary people you see it in a banner flown over a football match this week which makes me insane but we are, I think what um, Sammy said is right, we're at a tipping point now and so we will keep pushing to push us down the mountain. I'm mixing my metaphors but you know what I mean there. Okay, great. Um, Dylan says, I've been lucky enough to be working on two contracts. Um, probably yeah. got 60, 65 people really jealous now. Um, at the same company, the pay is good but not what the WGGB suggests. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, our minimums are in place for a reason. They shouldn't really be going under those minimums. Uh, I won't go into the details here, but um, that is something that you should definitely ring the office about and we can talk, talk you through that. Um, for people who don't know, we negotiate the bottom rates. We don't negotiate the top rates, only the, the absolute floor that no one should go under. Um, if you are being paid under that, then we need to hear about that because those those minimums are agreed across the industry. Okay. Um, yeah, and and, and then my my email address is on the website, so so let's talk about that. Um, so the last question uh, this is going to be. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up now. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This is our first one. I think it's gone well. Um, hopefully you've taken something from it. If we haven't answered your question, and, and I can see, I do apologise, we haven't answered a couple of questions. Um, Kate and I are going to work on getting back to you if you submitted it via Eventbrite. Um, if you submit it on the chat, um, please look out in our follow-up email, and Kate's um, email address is going to be on there. She's an organiser at the Guild, um, and maybe she's going to type it in the chat now and we will answer your questions. So, so get in contact with us. Um, if you've enjoyed the session, we're going to do some more. Um, the next one is going to be a week long festival for video games writers, but, but anyone is more than welcome to join. Um, it's going to be from the 6th to the 10th of July. Um, and, and there's a wonderful list of speakers. Um, so, so take a look. Um, and again, we'll put the link to those in a follow up email. Uh, thank you again for coming on probably the hottest day of the year so far. Um, so our final question to you both um, is what does solidarity mean? Um, well, it's this. It's this, that on the hottest day, people want to help each other and want to reach out to each other. Um, and I think, I think without it, writers are very lonely, very likely to be ripped off, uh, if I'm honest. Um, uh, I am so passionate that we are stronger together. I, I, I know it to be true. Um, 
and uh, I, I can only recommend if you are new to to the guild that uh, the best is yet to come because uh, it's about the best thing you could have done as a writer is to join. Would you agree, Lisa? Absolutely. I think a big part of our solidarity is knowing if it's if it's been done to you, it's been done to someone else, and there's enormous satisfaction. Um, when someone comes to us and we can solve those problems and it's, and it's very often a quick fix it's just a, a phone call um, a well-placed email and someone being shamed into behaving themselves properly but knowing that whatever's been done to you it's gone before we've heard it we know how to solve it and if you come to us we'll sort it out for you but please please don't be alone that's what we're here for we love um, putting on our kicking boots and kicking dolls down so that gives us that opportunity yeah really don't mess with me and lisa that's really yeah. the main thing pretty much <laughs> and i am mom great thanks everyone um and yeah as you say get in touch with us um and come to the next one thanks everybody thanks Bye, guys everyone.